All right. Good morning again, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Sarah Husky with 3C Ren. I've started recording this course, which will be posted on our on-demand page. Uh, we have Steve Mann with us from the Passive House Network and Home Energy Services to talk about Passive House trades. Before we get going, I just have a few slides to run through. Uh, we ask that everyone make sure that you're on mute during the course. If you'd like to verbally ask a question, uh, please raise your hand and we'll call on you to unmute yourself. Uh, but we also encourage you to ask questions in the chat. Um, I'll be monitoring that, uh, the chat box as well, so we can get those questions answered. Um, so a few words about who we are. Um, we are the Tri-County Regional Energy Network, also known as 3C REN. We're a uh, partnership between the counties of San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. Um, 3C REN is funded by ratepayer dollars, which are collected through the public goods charge found on our utility bills. And the benefit of being ratepayer funded is that there's no cost to those we serve, and we're able to return these dollars back to our local economy, which has historically missed out on some of these funds. Uh, 3C REN currently offers three programs. Uh, we offer our Energy Code Connect program, which serves building professionals by offering trainings and support to make the Energy Code easier to follow. Uh, within the Energy Code Connect pro program, we offer our Energy Code Coach service, which is an over the phone online and in the field support for Title 24, Part 6 and Part 11 questions. And the service is for both residential and non-residential projects. And then our next program is our building performance training program, which serves building professionals uh, by offering technical and soft skill trainings relating to building science principles and high performance buildings. There is a in-person training that I'd like to highlight that this program is offering. It is our uh, passive um, design build uh, in-person training, it's five days in San Luis Obispo. I put the flyer in the chat for those that are interested. Um, it's really great experience, hands-on hands training with EMU. Um, so for those that are interested, please fill out a uh, interest form and the program manager will touch base with you and get you enrolled. Um, and then the next program is our home energy savings program, which incentivizes contractors and helps residents save money and make their homes healthier with uh, energy efficient upgrades through incentives and rebates. Uh, and with that, I'll pass things over to Steve. Great, Sarah, thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all here. Glad you could make it. Uh, glad you have an interest in Passive House and specifically the trade. Uh, Sarah did mention the upcoming EMU training. It's the Passive House Tradesperson Training. Um, it's one of the few courses that is a hands-on course uh, for five days. It is a commitment, but um, EMU is the only organization in North America, in, in the United States, let me rephrase that, um, that has this kind of training. So this is like a, you know, a, a rare opportunity to actually participate in the course. And I'm assuming that since all of you are here because you're interested in an introduction to passive house trades, this is kind of like a, a teaser, I guess you might say. It'll give you an idea of what's gonna be offered in that course. Um, we're not gonna get terribly nerdy or dive into a lot of detail. Uh, passive house trades is designed for construction trades, primarily for builders and for builder crews and for subcontractors and people of other courts. It's not for, it's good for architects and passive house consultants, but it's really not geared towards them. It's geared towards the people that actually build these buildings. Um, so the EMU course is definitely hands-on. Um, I've taught it a few times myself and it's a lot of fun. So if you if you can spare the week, I would strongly encourage you to, to find the time and do it. Okay, and end of that commercial. Let me give you a different commercial. The Passive House Network, who is, is co-sponsoring this training on with 3C Ren. Uh, it's a national nonprofit. Our focus is on training 
uh, events, building capacity for uh, people who want to build passive house buildings. Uh, it is a national membership. There are a bunch of chapters. There is a California chapter. Uh, I'm not going to call out all these chapters that are shown on the slide here, but we're scattered all over the country. And um, there's lots of regional events. Path of House California does regional events as well. And uh, I would encourage you to sign up for the Path of Health Network email list. It'll keep you abreast of everything that's happening nationally. I would encourage you to sign up for the Path of Health California email list, which will keep you informed about what's happening in your local chapter. Okay. Now, here's just an example of um, the kinds of things that the Path of Health Network does. In, a mention, in addition to what Sarah mentioned, the EMU trades training, uh, which Path of Health Network is co-sponsoring, there is also probably our biggest offering is the uh, Passive House Consultant slash Designer Training. And I won't tell you the difference between the consultant versus designer, but it doesn't matter. It's the same training for both. It is a, a hybrid course. And you it, it has a regular schedule, which is shown on the screen. And there's one starting in October uh, for... Uh, members in PG&E territory, there is an incentive. I believe the current incentive is, the course retail price is about $2,200. And PG&E is currently offering, I believe, a $1,750 incentive. So you can do this course for about 500 bucks. Um, you know, you won't find a better deal anywhere. Oh, except 3C Ren offers this as well. And I think it's totally free for 3C Ren um, uh, people in the 3C rent territory. Anyway, this is as good as you're gonna get for passive house training. So I recommend you take a look at this if you have an interest in this stuff at all. This is the deep dive, it's pretty nerdy, but it prepares you to take the passive house consultant uh, training um, and pass the exam. It's a good exam prep course, uh, as well as just being informative about building science and passive house and everything. Okay, end of commercials for now. There'll be more later, don't worry. So here's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, first of all, an introduction to Passive House. For those of you who have not really been exposed to Passive House much, this will just kind of get your feet wet as to what the heck this stuff is and why it matters. Hopefully it'll be really clear why it matters um, and just sort of get you introduced. And then we'll dive a little bit further into some of the specifics. Not all of them. It's a very, very broad topic. Um, this is why, you know, the training takes five days for the tradesperson and goes on for several weeks for the consultant designer training. There's a lot of stuff here. So this is just to sort of, you know, wet your whistle, let's say. I'll dive into the envelope consideration, which is perhaps, depending on your point of view, the, the most important or, the, or the, the key portion of what Passive House is all about. Uh, then we'll do mechanical systems. Then I'll talk about quality assurance, quality control, and certification. This is kind of where the, the rubber hits the road as far as actually building passive house buildings. And then I'll give you a bunch of resources. Um, so hopefully this will pique your interest and you'll sign up for the EMU course and you'll sign up for the consultant designer course and um, all will be good. Uh, here's the introduction. I'm not going to read all this stuff. Um, you can read it yourself. Basically, we're going to talk about the five key principles for path valve projects, talk about uh, materials and methods, and things that builders should be focused on. Remember, this is this content is designed first and foremost for builders. All right. Uh, talk about how you actually get to build these things. Okay. It's sort of like I can tell you, well, here's what we want to do, here's how you do it, so on and so forth. But when it comes to building a building, buildings. Construction is complicated, let me put it that way. And um, it's one thing to look at a bunch of stuff on a screen. It's a whole different thing to actually get out there and pull out a bunch of tools and start putting these things together and actually build a building that meets the passive house requirement. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about that a bit. Uh, here's my bio. Um, just so that I'm a California guy. I've been doing California energy stuff for... Oh, at least 20 years, depends on your perspective. Uh, I'm a HERS Raider. I, I did used to do a bunch of lead stuff. Um, 
uh, used to do, uh, you know, certified energy analyst stuff. I still do Title 24, but only for passive house projects. I'm currently a self-employed passive house consultant. I'm certified as a uh, passive house consultant, passive house tradesperson, passive house trainer, uh, and a building certifier, which we'll talk about certification towards the end of this presentation. And I have designed and built my own passive house building. My two most recent projects are passive house certified and net zero and lead platinum certified. And I've been doing construction as a do-it-yourselfer for 35 years or so. Um, I'm not a certified construction professional. I'm not a general contractor. I don't have any trade licenses, any of that stuff. The beauty of being a do-it-yourselfer um, is I can pretty much wear all those hats without having to get certified for any of them. Um, and it's it's a great way. One of my soft spots for people involved in this is do-it-yourselfers who want to build their own house or retrofit their own house, because um, that's really where I come from. I've done seven or eight gut remodels over the years, uh, San Francisco, San Luis Obispo, Berkeley, and um, then I kind of uh, upgraded to complete buildings. Now, that's my background. Um, Sarah already asked about this. We got a couple of responses to this. Uh, if you do want to put more stuff in the chat, that'd be great. Uh, okay, I see we've got a passive house consultant in there. Great, good. Okay, we've got a residential designer from Marin, Go Bay Area. Uh, and Southern California, and some of your names look familiar. I have a feeling I've seen you in other classes here and there. Um, Ventura, and okay, Los Angeles. So yeah, we're three C Ren kind of territory, except for you know some some Bay Area folks that are kind of getting in there. I did one of these classes for PG&E about a month ago, a similar path to house course. We actually had somebody from Europe that dropped in. Um, so everybody's welcome. Let's not dwell on this anymore. We got what we got. Okay. Okay. Introduction to Passive House. Uh, this all came about from a guy. Well, it was this guy, Wolfgang Feist, and some of his colleagues. He can't take total credit for it. Uh, he was looking at building construction, and he said he's basically a physicist, and the Passive House Institute, who we are promoting their approach to the passive health process. Uh, a lot of physicists there. So we're talking like building science nerd. And he said, he read that the construction industry had experimented with adding insulation to new buildings and energy consumption had failed to reduce. This offended me. It was counter to the basic laws of physics. I knew that they must be doing something wrong. So I made it my mission to find out what and to establish what was needed to do it right. And over the course of several years, he and his colleagues identified a handful of key construction uh, methods and processes that if you do them, uh, you can build a building that has a whole bunch of benefits. And I'll talk about those in a few minutes, okay? But it was really the, the idea of, of the elements. And if you master these elements, which are not complicated, it's in a lot of ways, it's just common sense. But if you understand these and master them and incorporate them into your, your building practice, your design practice, uh, your subcontractor practice, whatever you're doing as far as, as it relates to building, you can build excellent high quality buildings. Okay. Um, and we have the salt, fat, acid, heat here. For those of you familiar with the book, um, the author of this, Samin Nostrad, basically said, well, if you understand how salt, fat, acid, and heat work, you can be a good cook, okay? So we, we think of the passive house approach kind of the same way. If you understand the basic elements, you can be a good building designer or builder. Passive house is a building standard. Uh, it's a process. It, it's a design process and it's, it's a construction process, okay? It applies to new and existing buildings. There are multiple sort of like niches in this. There's a new construction. There's a couple of different levels or tiers in new construction. Uh, same thing with retrofits, a couple of different tiers. Uh, there's a low energy building certification, so on and so forth. So a variety of things. All right. This slide says it's the most rigorous energy efficiency certification available. 
Uh, I'm not sure that I would totally support that statement. For those of you familiar with the Living Building Challenge, uh, that strikes me as a bit more rigorous, but outside it's it's like kind of over the top crazy how rigorous it is. Um, and there aren't a whole lot of living building standard, living building challenge buildings in the world because it's, but outside of that, passive house is, is where it's at. Uh, I got in touch, I learned about it about 15 years ago, and my immediate reaction was, this is great. Why would we build buildings any other way? Um, it is an energy efficiency standard, but there's more to it than just energy, right? It is a performance based approach. Uh, and it focuses on matching the drivers of building performance, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. The process is called passive houses, but that's really kind of misleading. Passive house building can be any type of building. Okay, and here's just a couple of examples. I do mostly single family residential because I like it. And that's what I've done as an owner builder too. Uh, but here's some big examples. Uh, Cornell Tech, that's a student dormitory uh, in New York, passive house certified. The Star Garment Factory in Sri Lanka, very hot, very humid climate. That's a retrofit, passive house certified. The Benton says V, I'm not sure where that is. Based on the picture, I'm guessing that it's a uh, New York multifamily housing, but I don't know. But again, a passive house certified. There are dozens and dozens of examples of all kinds of buildings, gymnasium, schools, swimming pool, commercial kitchens, uh, multifamily, so on and so forth. Um, so this really applies to any type of building. Okay, here are the goals. This actually, you know, the Wolfgang Feist talked about insulation and being offended at energy efficiency, performance not being improved. Well, actually, when they started digging into this, they decided that the driving factors should not be energy efficiency. It's really occupant comfort. Okay, and that that comes in lots of different flavors. Okay, there's thermal comfort, where the temperatures inside are always uh, comfortable. You don't have any cold areas. You don't have any hot areas. You don't have any drafts. You don't have things like that. Um, second thing was hygienic condition. Okay, you want to build a building that has no possibility of developing any mold or mildew or condensation or things of that sort, which go towards slowly, but guaranteed they will destroy the building over a period of time. Um, third thing was indoor air quality. This is a big focus. Um, we spend more time inside our buildings than we do outside, and the air quality inside generally is not very good. And so. Uh, unless you live in a passive house, in a passive house, it is good, okay? Um, energy efficiency, if you do these things where you look at comfort and hygiene and mold and air quality and things, uh, and you create, you use the passive house element to create those conditions, as an outgrowth of that, and sort of like a side effect, you get energy efficiency. The focus is not to design and build for energy efficiency. The goal is to design and build for the occupants. And as a result of that, you get energy efficiency. And as a result of that, you get durability. And as a result of that, perhaps this last thing on the slide here is you get affordability. Common question is how much does it cost to build a passive house? Uh, and it varies widely. Um, in the residential world, the typical numbers we talk about, well, is the, the um, uh, the additional cost can range between, say, 2 to 15%. And a lot of that depends on the design and the experience of the construction team. I've also seen cases where multifamily um, a market rate housing can be built for below market rate cost. Uh, commercial buildings, I've also seen numbers in the low 1% to 2%. So it depends. It depends on the project, it depends on the location, it depends on the designers, depends on the experience of the team, so on and so forth. So it can be done for no extra cost. Typically there is a little bit extra cost, uh, but uh, we're getting there. Okay, here are the drivers. Remember salt, fat, acid, and heat. Well, here are the five basic passive house principles, okay? 
First one is continuous climate specific insulation levels. What you want to do is you want to build a thermos. You want to build an insulated thermos that has just the right amount of insulation for the climate zone. It's very climate specific. Okay. Uh, and it varies. In Southern California, where many of you are located, uh, you could be looking at a two by six wall with an inch of continuous insulation on the outside, which is really about what Title 24, the energy code, calls for. So some of these in California, because of our climate, uh, in many locations, uh, we can build passive house buildings that are essentially not terribly different from code built buildings. So this is where the cost factor comes into play. Uh, and insulation is one aspect of that. Second thing is a thermal bridge free connection. A thermal bridge, for those of you who haven't heard that term, is a, is a location in a building where you can have thermal energy movement uh, from inside to outside or outside to inside, depending on the condition that you don't want. You don't want thermal energy moving through a building envelope. You want to keep um, the heating in the winter inside the building. You want to keep the cooling in the summer inside the building, regardless of what's happening inside. When you have thermal bridges, uh, you, you don't have those conditions, right? Uh, you have unwanted thermal transfer. And just to put that in context for later on, thermal transfer happens from hot to cold. Energy moves from hot to cold. It does not move from cold to hot. It's the second... I think it's the second law of thermodynamics. So just sort of keep that in mind. When I talk to clients, um, I always just explain to always think hot to cold, hot to cold, hot to cold. Okay. If you have a thermal fridge free, thermal bridge free building, you don't have that kind of move. Number three is air tightness. I think of this as a superpower of buildings. When I used to do just building retrofit consulting, I would say to people, the first thing you can do, the most important thing you can do is make your building airtight. If you do nothing else, just do that. You get lots of side benefits from that that um, solve a lot of problems. So if you combine number one and number three, continuous insulation and airtightness, I basically tell people, when you're building the building, you're designing the building, think of it as you're building an airtight balloon, a well-insulated balloon. And if you keep that mantra in mind, um, that's two of the five principles, and that gets you pretty much almost where you want to be. Number four is high-performance windows and doors with solar protection. There's a couple of factors involved here. High-performance does not mean triple-glazed windows. It might. It depends on the building design, how much glazing there is, lots of other factors. Um, there's a misconception that all passive house buildings have to have triple pane windows. Not true. If you do have triple pane windows, it's easy to achieve the other path, passive house goals. Okay, but you can do it with double pane windows as well. I've got a project right now where we're looking at the double pane versus triple pane question. Um, and double pane looks like it might work out. Okay, to be to be determined. Okay. You need to think about the windows and doors as an extension of the envelope, okay? Remember, we want insulation and we want air tightness. Well, the windows have to be high quality enough so that they're airtight, okay? And then they have to be uh, have good uh, insulative properties, like a decent R value on the glazing and the frame so that they become part of the uh, thermos. Okay? Remember, think a well-insulated balloon with a thermos wrapping let's let's put it that way the windows are part of that skin so they need to perform well as part of that skin okay once you do all of that stuff you have a tight building remember we need to think about the occupants and when you have a tight building you have to worry about the air quality because if you don't deal with the air quality issues the occupants are not going to be happy uh, so the fifth principle that we look at is Heat recovery ventilation. Now, the key there is first and foremost ventilation. We want to bring in fresh air. We want to exhaust stale air. And when we bring in fresh air, we want to filter it. Uh, and I'll talk about this some more when we get into the mechanical question. Okay. And we want it to be high efficiency also uh, because it uses very little energy. And the really good quality heat recovery ventilators 
use very little electricity. It's pretty amazing what they do, uh, considering you know what little they can do. Uh, and then the heat recovery portion of that basically means that um, when you're moving air into the building, moving air out of the building, you essentially don't lose any heat. Now that would be the wintertime condition. The same is true in the summertime. You basically don't lose any cooling. Now you do lose some, but it's a small fraction, say 10%. And I'll, I'll explain this more when we get into the ventilation system. But the heat recovery part of it is, is important as well. It's not just the ventilation, it's not just the efficiency, it's also the heat recovery capacity of that equipment. Okay, these are the five basic elements. And if you, if you learn these and you sort of burn them into your brain, whatever you're doing in the construction industry, whether it's passive health or not, you get a better result. It's that simple. Okay. Now, in the passive house world, this is how we do it. We model these buildings. Okay. And this is done, this is a design process. This is not a construction process. It starts out early on uh, with architects when they're even sketching things out on paper, you know, with pencil. I still know architects that do pencil drawings. It's amazing. Uh, we take this information and we build a model in something called the passive house planning package. And this has been around for 25 years or so. It's a really big Excel spreadsheet. Um, it comes in metric and imperial versions. Okay, so there's there is a North American friendly version, uh, which is good if you don't speak metric. And it's been proven for 25 years that it's an accurate modeling tool. Uh, they've done a lot of studies where they've said, okay, well, here's what the model says, and here's what the building does when it's being occupied. Do they align? And the answer is yes, they do align for the most part. And um, I mean, there's always outliers for any kind of, of real world situation. But um, I use the past house planning package on a daily basis. And it's pretty darn impressive. It's, it's way more accurate than anything we use for Title 24 modeling. I'll just put that out there. I don't want to bash Title 24 because I do it, but it's just not that accurate. Past house planning package is much, much more accurate for many reasons. Um, I do see a question. Thank you, Sarah, for saving that, but I just glanced over at the question thing or the chat box. I'll, I'll go ahead and take questions as we go along from George. Question, my mind keeps returning to this question. How can we protect occupants from running out of fresh air and power outage conditions following earthquake, blackout, tsunami, et cetera? Good question, George. A couple of answers to that. One is um, install batteries, okay? Install solar, so you've got a source of electricity. Um, those are a couple of possibilities. Now that involves, you know, special wiring of the building to accommodate those things to make sure that the ventilation equipment keeps working. Uh, when you do have power outages uh, and you don't have electric backup of any kind, there's really no good answer. The only thing I can suggest is uh, open the windows. You may get fresh air, depends on the circumstances. If there's a wildfire outside, you won't. Uh, but we can't we can't design these buildings to deal with all circumstances. Uh, I know when we had our, our orange sky here in San Francisco and Berkeley two years ago, or was it three years ago now, um, we just kept the ventilation system running. Uh, we didn't have a power outage, so we were lucky in that respect. Um, and it worked great. I had to change the filters more often, but that was really it. Uh, when we get power outages now, we've installed a battery, so we've got it. We've got everything wired so that uh, we have a power outage now. We'll still have ventilation for probably six to eight hours, and our power outages here in in Berkeley never last that long. Um, so uh, that's the best answer I've got for that. There's no there's no perfect solution to that. Well. I know people that are installing huge solar arrays and large battery backups, but that involves a lot of money that most people don't have. Uh, so if you've got that kind of money, that's a solution. Uh, hope they, that, I hope that answers your question, George. Okay. Pass it out the planning package. So uh, this is, this is the prediction thing. Okay. Passive houses, Reduce energy consumption, you know, significantly over, you know, other systems. Uh, 
Idle 24 is not in this graph, but it ought to be because you'd have the same thing. It would perform better. Typically, we say that a passive house building reduces energy consumption over a co-built home by 75 to 80%, something on that order. Okay. And every project is different, uh, but it's, it's in that range. Okay. And like I said, there are many projects that have been monitored and tested to prove this outright. Now, what happens is if you reduce your energy consumption, you can also downsize your mechanical equipment uh, significantly. Uh, just to give you an idea, it's, we used to say in a passive house, you could heat it with a hair dryer. Well, in my passive house in the winter time, we actually can heat it with a hair dryer. The heating load is that small. It's about uh, 3,000 uh, BTUs, which is about 1,000 watts something on that order. And I think a hair dryer is, you know, 800 watts, without something in that range. But we don't actually heat it with a hair dryer, but we could. I've got a small electric resistance radiant system that does the job just fine. But in fact, it hardly ever comes on because if the house just doesn't need much heating and we don't have any cooling and the house never goes over 77 degrees, at least so far, that may change in the coming years. Okay. So, but the benefit is, is that you reduce the heating and cooling requirements, you reduce the equipment size. And so you reduce the cost of that equipment. And so consequently, you can offset the cost of a passive house construction process by reduced mechanical equipment sizes. That doesn't necessarily totally play it off or no, totally balance out, but it can make a big dent in it, especially on large multifamily buildings. Okay. So there are definitely financial benefits to building passive house buildings. Construction is complicated. I mentioned this. Um, there are so many aspects. Uh, I'm not going to read this list off. I know that that in single family residential, you don't necessarily have all the stuff. You don't have all these specialists. Uh, you don't have all these certifications or these sub trades, things like that. But uh, in larger multifamily buildings or commercial buildings, these all come into play and others. So there's this can get complicated with or without passive house. Okay, passive house adds another another layer or another set of nuances to it. Let me put it that way. So it can make it a little bit more complicated, but the end result is significantly better. So now remember the focus is hygiene, comfort, and as a side effect, efficiency. Okay, we just we want to repeat that message several times. Um, comfort is number one, hygiene is number two, and efficiency just fall back. The trades to focus on, well, again, it depends on the project, but here, like, you know, the key one, um, carpentry, masonry, steel, foundation, heating, cooling, and ventilation, of course, plumbing, electrical. And in the passive house world, we've got verification, testing, and commissioning. In the commercial world, we've got verification, testing, and commissioning. In the residential world in California, because of our HERS requirements, we've got a certain degree of verification, testing, and commissioning. So. The, the verification testing and commissioning for a passive house building is very, very similar to what you might find in a project uh, with first requirements in California. Um, in some ways, it's easier. In some ways, it can be more complex, depends on the project. So there's, there's nothing radically different here. The difference is, is that in the passive house world, uh, you want to, all the trades involved in a project, ideally in a perfect world, all the trades understand what we're trying to achieve, that we're trying to build a passive health building. And there are these specific five elements that we focus on. And that affects individually each one of these trades in certain ways. For instance, in the plumbing, you don't want the plumbers, when they're doing rough in, to punch a lot of holes in the building that are difficult or impossible to seal up. Remember, you're building a balloon. And you want the plumbers to realize you're building a balloon and they shouldn't mess up the balloon, okay? Very simple. Same thing with electrical. Um, same thing, well, steel is a thermal bridge issue. You wanna get rid of steel during the design stage if you can, um, but you can't always do that, all right? Carpentry, same thing. You want, they, they oftentimes the carpenters, the framers are gonna be responsible for, for the air barrier, at least in a residential context. And so they need to know how they're going to achieve that, how they're supposed to achieve that, um, and the impact it has on the building. Okay. 
So this kind of logic sort of permeates the whole process. Uh, okay, here's the logic. All right, here's the drivers. Going back to this is sort of like a little recap, okay? Uh, continuous insulation, thermal bridge-free connections, an airtight enclosure, high-performance windows and doors, and mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. And out of that, you get a healthy indoor environment. You get a comfortable environment. You get efficiency um, uh, of the building operation. You get a building that's going to be more durable than a co-built building. It's not uncommon for passive house building. At least they target them for you know a couple hundred year lifetime. Okay, uh, totally doable. Okay. Um, the key way you accomplish this is focus. Everybody needs to understand their role and they need to focus on that. Uh, when I built my house, certified passive house, it has all these things that we're talking about here. It is healthy, comfortable, efficient, durable, and it was relatively affordable for the Bay Area. Okay. Uh, the builder had never built a passive house before. Uh, the subcontractors had never even heard of passive house before. Uh, but they were motivated and they were smart and they were interested and they really wanted to do this, unlike everybody else I talked to uh, that was available and was willing to travel, you know, more than a couple of miles. And uh, we built a passive house uh, and they did a great job. And it was because they understood their role and they were focused uh, on producing that kind of building. Okay. So that's all it takes, you know, five principles to focus. All right, let's talk about the passive house criteria. Uh, let's repeat the uh, mantra here, health, comfort, efficient, durable. Okay. Uh, all right, let's talk about comfort. There are a couple different kinds of comfort that we deal with here. Remember I talked about uh, thermal comfort and I also talked about a uh, mold moisture condensation uh, and things of that sort, okay. First of all, we look at thermal comfort. Now, the passive house planning package, uh, when you build this model of this building, it looks to see if any surfaces are below a certain temperature. We have a range of temperatures we look at. It's basically 68 degrees to 77 degrees. Anything within that range is considered comfortable. Now, that's not achievable in all buildings at all times. So we say, okay, fine. On the low end, during the colder seasons, the temperature can drop down below that in certain circumstances, but it cannot drop below, uh, in this case, in floors 66.2 and uh, other surface temperatures, no more than 7.6 degrees Fahrenheit, below the operative indoor temperature, which is a complex calculation. Basically, what I tell people is, well, you don't want any surface going below about 62 degrees, okay? There are different criteria for different types of purposes to meet the comfort criteria. That's the nerdy stuff. We're not gonna talk about it. Um, the wind points are windows. Really what it does, it also looks at windows because they're gonna be most likely to drop below that 62 degrees. And if that's the case, the passive house planning package says, oh, those windows are a problem. You need to deal with that issue. Um, you cannot certify this building because the windows are going to be too cold under certain circumstances based on the climate data for this location, okay? So that's the comfort part. The hygiene and health has to do with, what well, it kind of has to do with thermal bridges. If you have a thermal bridge, and that's where you have all these little circles, we look at all of these places where we can have thermal bridges, okay? Hopefully you can see my cursor. And we do a, a finite element analysis of those. That's this stuff on the right-hand side here. And we say, okay, what's the likelihood that the interior temperature is going to dip below a certain level at certain junction? And in this case, we're looking at the junction right here where the window hits the interior framing. All right. And that's just one example of a junction. Okay. There are others. And we look at all of this stuff and we have a factor called an FRSI. Again, this is a nerdy thing. I'm not going to dig into it too much. Basically, we we calculate these numbers for all these junctions, and if it dips below a certain point, we say, okay, that location is going to be prone for moisture, mold, mildew, condensation formation, all of those things, which is, first of all, not healthy for the occupants, 
You don't want that stuff in the indoor air. But second of all, it's going to help degrade the building more quickly than it would otherwise. Uh, and we don't want that either. Okay. So that's sort of like one of our key metrics, the FRSI. Um, okay. So then when we've got the air tightness, well, we want the air tightness. So we measure that and we have this metric called air changes per hour. And this is a test we do to determine how tight the building is. Okay. The ACH 50 is air changes per hour at 50 pascals, which is a pressure measurement. And we actually do a blower door test. That's this thing over here, this red thing in the door there. Okay, and it's a big fan, or maybe it's two fans. For a really big building, it might be multiple things in the doors. Okay, that's a non-technical description. Um, and we measure how tight the building is at 50 pascals, which is a very low pressure. It's sort of the equivalent of about a 20 degree wind hitting the outside of the building, which is not an abnormal set of circumstances. And we want to measure this because if you don't have an airtight building, if you've got air that can move in and out of the building under various circumstances, you're going to have thermal transfer. You don't want that. Okay. So it's it's kind of like a an air-created thermal bridge. I don't know if that's a, a good way to describe it. That just came to mind. It's it's a thermal bridge, but it's not through a material, it's through a, a leak in the building envelope. Okay, but the end result is the same thing. You lose energy when you don't want to be losing energy, or you're transferring energy when you don't want to be transferring energy. So we make the buildings very airtight. This is, a, on the surface, this is a tough thing to do if you've never done this. Um, and this, when I've ever worked with first-time passive health builders, they find this to be the scariest thing because you don't know how airtight the building is until you partially built. And if it's not airtight, it may be too tough to make it airtight if you didn't achieve this. Um, and the way you achieve this is you plan it early on. The building plans and the details describe how you're going to blend the different elements of the building so that you create the balloon, which is what you're going for. And if those details are followed properly, because the subcontractors are focused and they know this is the goal and they have clear documents that tell them how to achieve this, um, they can do this. And it's a whole lot of fun to, um, when you do a first time building, a first time builder does their first passive house and they do the blower door test and they hit this metric or they get less than it. Um, it's a cause for celebration, you know, pizza and beer and all of that stuff uh, because they realize it's doable and it's not scary and it all works, okay? So this is what we achieve. And when we do this, if we get an airtight as a closure, we can control thermal movement in and out of the building. And then we set the stage for the ventilation system. Okay. Uh, we talked about windows. Steve, oh, yes. Sorry, there is a, a question in the chat. Um, just George is oh. asking, are big buildings like that going floor by floor with leak testing uh, to account for different pressures? Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, my chat didn't scroll. So let me pull that up. Uh, our big buildings. Oh, and then I see I heard batteries outside renewable people opening windows. One about fail open windows that open to vent a power outage. Uh, creates need to filter out there. Right there. I don't know about fail open windows that open to vent of power outages. Um, I'm only familiar with windows that people opening flows. Um, so in commercial buildings, I guess that's a thing, but I've never heard of that actually, except for CO2 monitored three. But going to the question you called out, Sarah, are big buildings like that going to going floor by floor with leak testing since pressure at the top floor is lower than the bottom floor? Um, yes and no. On big buildings, it's not, the final test in a passive house building is a whole building test. So you yes, you have different pressures at the top and the bottom, but people that do blower door testing on large buildings are aware of this and they do pressure measuring at the top and the bottom to compensate for the differential. That's a well-known science, okay? That can be done. But what can happen is you do intermediate blower door testing, um, so let's say floor by floor or unit by unit or some subset of the whole building 
because on a really large building, it's not going to be all at the same finished stage at the same time. So there are both these intermediate testings of bits and pieces, but at the end, uh, it's the whole building. And for large buildings, you have to have a strategy to figure out how you're going to do that because not all buildings, large buildings, have openings between the whole top from the top to the bottom. So that can create some challenges. That's a real specialty testing thing. So, but people that do this are aware of that and do know how to deal with it. Okay. Hopefully that answers the question. Good question. Um, windows. We need good windows. Excellent thermal performance, airtight. Uh, the biggest problem I've seen in residential buildings have been substandard windows that are not airtight. They either uh, leak because they're not properly installed or they leak because they're not terribly high quality. Uh, and there are different ways to deal with that. But I've seen it more on bigger windows and let's say sliding doors. And say the bigger the, the glazing structure, the more likely that there's going to be a certain amount of leakage. Okay. And remember, here's the interior surface temperature. Overall, windows are the weakest link, weakest link in a building when you're talking about performance. They have the lowest R value, so they have the most, the highest likelihood of having thermal bridges. They have the higher likelihood of, of not being airtight. So you, the windows are a critical component that you have to have to figure out. Okay. Uh, let me go back here. Okay. And then I talked about ventilation. In the passive house world, we have specific criteria. Um, it's got to be filtered, and in this case, we're looking at MERV, the equivalent of MERV 13 filters on incoming air, and at least MERV 6 filters on the outgoing air, for those of you that know about MERV. That's a level of filtration. The higher the number, the better the filtration. The heat recovery has to be at least 75% efficient. The projects I work on are typically 85 to 90% efficient. Uh, the fan power has to be below 0.765 watts per CFM. That's cubic feet per minute, the amount of air they move. Um, this is very efficient. Um, you can ventilate a house of, say, 1,000 square feet for about 30 watts, uh, which is pretty darn low. Okay. Has to be balanced, too. You don't want to create pressure differentials inside the building. Okay. So, uh, so 100 cubic feet per minute coming in, you want to exhaust roughly 100 cubic feet per minute going out. Okay. Uh, this is good for occupants. This is really good for schools. There's studies that show that high CO2 levels um, are bad for everybody, uh, but especially in school, it makes people sleepy. When I first finished my house, uh, our blower door test was 0.43 air changes per hour for the final test. Um, I put a CO2 monitor in the bedroom. And I found that overnight, the CO2 level was going up to about 1,200 uh, parts per million, I believe is the metric. Uh, anything over 1,000, that depends on what experts you talk to. Anything over 1,000 is considered not very healthy. Okay. And um, this... The graphs here on the left show a school where they measured in a school, a not passive house school, uh, where it was not airtight and it was not ventilated. And in the classrooms, they were getting parts from me in like the 5,000 range. Definitely bad. Okay. So in a passive house in a gymnasium, on the other hand, they measured and finally they were getting under 1,000 consistently. So this is the kind of performance you get. In my house, since we were going over 1,000, I actually tweaked the ventilation system just a little bit to keep it under a thousand. Uh, and I was glad I was able to do that easily. Okay. So there are other, there are other criteria, a bunch of miscellaneous things. Okay. But it all comes back to comfort and durability and efficiency and so on and so forth. Uh, heating and cooling for the mechanical equipment. Typically we are looking at heat pumps, although you don't have to have heat pumps. Uh, like I said, my floor is an electric resistance radiant. Uh, if I had to do it in retrospect, I would make it a heat pump, but the technology didn't exist when I finished the building. Uh, you want to keep it small. When you're doing heat pumps, it's shown that if you oversize heat pumps uh, compared to the load that they need to satisfy, they're not going to perform well. Uh, they're going to be inefficient. Um, they're not going to keep the interior uh, environment as comfortable as you would like. They're going to turn on and off their any 
There are lots and lots of reasons why you want to size the equipment properly to match the loads. Okay. Uh, for hot water, and this you should do this in any building, you want efficient hot water, efficient piping layout, insulation, um, heat pumps, of course. And uh, here it says bath water, bath wastewater heat recovery encouraged. Uh, there's not a whole lot of benefit uh, for that in mild climates, but in colder climates up in the mountains, up in Canada, so on and so forth, that's not an uncommon thing to do. It just helps you recover energy from your hot water before it leaves the building. Okay. And appliances and lighting, you know, all LED lighting, all, you know, uh, conduction cooktops, I'm sorry, induction cooktops, so on and so forth. Uh, design the building to use as little energy as possible. We do have, okay, here's the criteria. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about this in detail. I don't want to bore you. This is nerdy stuff, okay? Basically, in order for a building to be certified, it has to meet a certain heating demand criteria. That's the amount of energy consumed by the building in the course of a year to heat it, okay? And it needs to be low. Remember, we're talking 75 to 80% below a code built house. Uh, for cooling, we have the same thing, okay? A low threshold for cooling demand, annual energy consumption to cool the building. Uh, we've got the air tightness test, 0.6 air changes per hour or less. And then we also have this thing called primary energy renewable. This is a measure of how much energy, uh, how much source energy the building is going to consume to operate everything. So that's based on the appliances, the mechanical equipment, the occupants, everything else. Uh, so you can only consume so much energy in the building. But if you design it as a passive house building, uh, typically you're going to be able to meet this source energy demand. The passive house world, we call it primary energy. Um, in the Title 24 world, we call it source energy. Or in other worlds, too, it's called source energy. Okay. Uh, there are also criteria for retrofit, and there are two approaches to retrofits. One is, again, the modeling approach shown on the left. There are, again, heating and cooling requirements and air changes per hour shown over here, which is one. For retrofits, it's a little more flexible. It's a little easier to hit the metrics. Or there's this thing called the component criteria. So for everything that you change in the retrofit, it needs to meet these thresholds. Okay, and so this is going to be like our values um, for what you do in the wall or the U factors for the glazing or, you know, so on and so forth, those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, this is based on climate zone, as is this. Okay, so the retrofits are not climate zone specific. Like in a normal new construction, we talk about, okay, this building is in Pasadena. Where retrofit, it basically looks at, well, it's in a warm, a warm, temperate climate zone. Okay, so it's slightly different. Again, it's easier to hit the metrics on a retrofit. Certification is part of the process. There are 30 certifiers working in the United States. I'm one of them. Um, there are a bunch of people that have certified buildings. Certification is not required. You can build a passive health building and not certify. About half of my clients don't want to certify because it does add an extra layer of uh, administrative stuff. Um, you know, there's a little more paperwork. There's, you have to hire a certifier, uh, you know, so on and so forth. But from my perspective, it's really the only way to know for sure that you've built a passive house because it's basically like an audit. It's a third party that has a, another pair of eyes that looks at everything that goes into this building. So, Certifiers are typically passive house designers or consultants that have done additional training and have worked on several buildings, and then they become certifiers, uh, and it's basically reviewing other people's work. Okay. So, like I said, if you really want to build a passive house building, I would encourage you to certify it, but not essential. There are certified components. Uh, going back to the interfit, here's the certified components approach. Here are these certified components, opaque envelope things, transparent envelope things, services like heat pumps and ventilation system. If you use all certified components on things you change on the building, you can certify a retrofit that way. There are certified professionals. There are some here in the web, but are some certified um, 
uh, designers or consultants. Okay, a designer is actually an architect that has taken the same exam as the consultant, um, but they're actually certified as an architect in the United States. That's the distinction. Same test, same basic course. Okay, certified tradespeople, which is what we Sarah and I were talking about earlier. I would encourage you to do that. This is a picture of the hands-on certified tradesperson course right here done by EMU. So you can see it's definitely hands-on. You build little passive house buildings. Okay, and you talk about everything that goes into that. Um, just to reiterate, here are the goals, health, comfort, efficiency, durability. Uh, and you get that, you know, out of that, you get good surface temperatures, air tightness, ventilation, efficient, MVP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, we're repeating the product. This is repeating the commercial just a little bit, just in case you forgot some of this stuff. Passive house building is a team sport. There's lots of people that may be involved, okay, depending on the size of the building and the nature of the project. Uh, in my case, on my house, I was basically the architect, the engineer, the consultant, the passive house consultant, the verifier, the inspector the ventilation commissioning and the blower door tester, okay? Uh, and I was the owner and the owner's rep. I was not the certifier. That was the Path of Health Institute. And I was partly the builder, okay? I was the I was the air sealing specialist when I went around at the end of the day and looked at everybody else's work and fixed all their, fixed all their air sealing mistakes, okay? Or, or consulted and advised with them. On larger buildings, there are lots of individuals that can be involved here. And this is a partial list. There are many, many more. Okay. What you need to do is, and I kind of alluded to this and talked about it, you need to have a common goal. Okay. Everybody needs to know you're building a passive house. And you need to have a common language. Everybody needs to know about air tightness and air sealing and air changes per hour and uh, our values and so on and so forth. Uh, most importantly, they need to have good attitude and focus, okay? Training is a good thing, okay? Tradesperson training, consultant designer training, all good. Uh, but you can do this without that training, okay? Uh, and willingness to work as a team. It is a team sport. The most successful projects are ones where whatever, however many members there are in the team, you all talk to each other and you all um, communicate, and you all understand what you're trying to achieve. Uh, here's the certification process. I'm just gonna touch on this. You get a certifier and or designer involved early on before you even have construction documents. And that person gets involved all the way through and everybody on the team pays attention to all this stuff all the way through. Ideally, you have your team assembled very early on too. At the very least, you want to have your, your architect for sure, your pass out consultant, uh, your certifier, your structural engineer, most likely, your builder. And maybe the builder wants to bring in some of the trades. MEP typically is going to come in early. You bring them all in. You take them through the process. At the end or in the middle, there are some documentation requirements that have to be done, some submittal, and there's extra stuff here. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this. It's, it's not a complicated process but there are details, okay? All right, let's go back to the principle. I'm kind of speeding here just to make sure we don't run out of time. Uh, I see we've got a lot of a lot of stuff to go yet. Uh, okay, not a question, just a noise, okay. Uh, we talked about the four principles, continuous insulation, climate specific, thermal bridge free connections, air tightness, high performance windows, doors, and solar protection. Solar protection means that you've got the right amount of shading where it's needed, when it's needed, okay? Sometimes you want solar gain to come in the building. Sometimes you want to block it. Okay, insulation comes in many ways, shapes, and forms. Here's mineral wool on an outside wall. Um, here's the thermos idea. I talked about that. You want to think of it as you're building a thermos, okay? And you want to wrap the entire building in insulation somewhere. Okay, and we have a thing we do called the red line test, where we tell the architects or the designers, okay, on your drawings, take a red line or a red pencil or a red whatever and outline the thermal boundary. 
okay? And make sure that it's clear so that everybody knows where it is and how it's created with what material, okay? You can do that with any kind of insulation. Like I said, mineral wool on the left, there's uh, looks like polyisocyanurate or EPS or XPS in the middle. And on the right, we've got like a wood fiber. Uh, those of you that are um, low carbon conscious, uh, the wood fiber and sheep's wool and hempcrete and natural based products are becoming very popular. Cellulose because it's high recycled content. Uh, we're trying to get away from foam for various reasons. A mineral wool is good, although it has high embodied carbon, but it's great in wildfire. In wooey zones, we call them a world wildfire urban interface or wilderness urban interface, whatever the acronym stands for. Fire zone is what I call them. Um, so they're good for that. Mineral wool is very popular in most of the projects I'm working on. Uh, you can get spray products, spray foam. Here's, oops, here's, Spray cellulose, here's spray foam, here's spray cellulose behind a, a membrane, here's spray cellulose in an attic, here's spray cellulose in a in an eye joist, okay, so on and so forth. Lots of different types of materials for spray insulation. Uh, bat insulation, it's common because insulators like it because it's cheap. Uh, they can they can often do bat insulation less expensive than any other type of insulation. And it comes in, you know, I, this is uh, hemp-based, I believe. This is fiberglass. This is sheep wool. Notice it doesn't give off any itchy fibers. That's a good thing. Um, with bad insulation, you have to be careful about how it's installed. In Title 24, we have this thing called a QII inspection. It's a quality insulation installation inspection. That's based on the fact that the energy code assumes that whoever's installing insulation is going to do a lousy job, like shown in this picture here. And so what happens is you have a HERS inspector come in and look at the way it's installed to say, no, you did it well. So it, it, it boosts the energy performance of the building. So if you're doing BATS, you want to make sure that you have a QII inspection. It's not required in Title 24. It's part of the prescriptive baseline, but you can get away without doing it if you want but you're crazy not to do it. Um, it's, it's cheap and the end result is well worth the money. More examples, you can have band insulation with a rigid board and foam too. It's, it's all the same stuff. Uh, it's all the same problem, let me put it that way. Gray foam can delaminate. So um, that's part of the insulation inspection, but it's also some people assume that spray foam creates an airtight assembly. That's not true because this can happen, okay? So you don't want to depend on foam to create uh, an airtight uh, barrier or an assembly, okay? It just doesn't work over time. It might look great out of the gate, but over time, this kind of thing is going to happen. Assembly characteristics. Now, there's, there's lots of things that an assembly has to accomplish, okay? The biggest one is bulk water, okay? We don't want water getting in the building. Okay. In the passive house world, we worry about vapor control. We want to make sure that if there's if there's vapor moving into a building assembly, that it has a way to get out of that assembly. And we can do that by having vapor open assemblies. We can also control that by having membranes that don't allow vapor to get into the assemblies. Lots of different ways to do that. Uh, there's the air tightness effect, of course, and then thermal control the insulation. So uh, a building assembly has to accomplish all of these things. Remember, we had the FRSI guide, okay? This looks at interior surface temperatures uh, to, to determine that we do not have any unwanted thermal bridges that are going to cause both comfort issues and possibly mold and mildew issues, all right? So we, we look at all of them. Uh, we don't want vapor barriers for the most part. You have to be very careful about these. Uh, they trap moisture. And if they trap moisture in a building assembly, this is the kind of thing that results, okay? Uh, on the left, you get mold. On the right, you get condensation. There are some building codes that require vapor barriers in colder climates. Um, there may be, that may make sense in a colder climate, okay? 
Um, there are other ways to deal with that issue in colder climate. Here in California, it's not a problem in most locations, okay? If you do have a cold climate, you need to look at this issue very carefully. Lots of different ways to accomplish all this stuff, all these goals, okay? The water, the vapor, the air, and the thermal control, all right? Uh, in the passive health world, we do lots of different things. This is a pretty common assembly, okay? Uh, a backfitted rain screen, okay, that's for bulk water, and that's going to be the siding or something. Uh, a wind tight board insulation, that's typically going to be your sheathing, okay, which you're probably going to need for seismic requirements anyway. Uh, and then a vapor open waterproof airtight layer on the sheathing, maybe. It doesn't have to be there, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed something here. This was board insulation on the outside, okay. Then you're waterproof airtight layer, which is going to be your sheathing with your uh, air barrier and your water barrier. Then here's your framed wall. And then here's uh, another airtight layer here that might be the case, vapor variable. That's how you can control moisture moving in and out of the building. And then an interior finish. This, this is a lot of information in this slide. There are lots of different ways to accomplish this. Um, the Passive House tradesperson training talks about this stuff a lot. Um, so I would say if you really want to learn about this, well, go to buildingsciencecorporation.com. They have a bunch of online stuff about this. Uh, but the tradesperson training is also a great source. Other possibilities, okay, this is kind of the same thing. You want to accomplish the same thing. Air control, water control, vapor control, insulation, okay. Uh, you can do it with structural insulated panels. I've got a client that's determined to do SIPs. I did SIPs on my uh, certified ADU in my backyard, at least for part of the structure. Um, that was an interesting experiment. Uh, double stud walls. Some people do this. You can get huge R values in a wall doing this kind of thing. But it's basically the same thing. Instead of a single frame wall, like a two by six wall, you've got, say, two two by four walls. Uh, and a big cavity in the middle, as big as you want, and you fill it all up with insulation. Uh, trusses. I have one client in Colorado that wanted to do this, and he changed his mind. Basically, you build a structural wall, okay, and that holds the building up and does everything you need the structure to do. And then you hang another wall off of it, and you fill that with insulation. And the thing you hang off of it is non-structural, but it's filled with insulation and it can be as thick as you want. Um, so you can get a huge R value this way, okay? And it, as shown by the guy on the left, it can have some structural value, uh, but not what's typically required by the structural engineer. Insulated concrete forms, it's basically a sandwich of foam on the inside and outside filled with concrete. Um, and um, that can work. Also, I've seen people use that on basements primarily because uh, you get a good structural value. For you low embodied carbon folks, all the concrete is not a great thing. Uh, but you can build a nice passive house structure this way. Uh, and you can get it, as shown in the, the detail on the right, you can insulate the slab here and you can tie the ICF into it. So you get a nice insulated corner where you don't have a thermal bridge of any kind. Okay, thermal bridges often happen at corners. Uh, this is insulation on the entire slab on grade. This is pretty typical on a passive house. This is one reason why they cost a little bit more at times, because most code built buildings don't require um, or don't use under slab insulation. It's required in California in Title 24 if you have a radiant floor, but in normal market rate housing, we don't have radiant floors, so this is not done. Uh, this is a really good idea in most cases. I found it in Southern California. In fact, this can work against you in terms of your cooling load uh, because what it does is it, it doesn't let you take advantage of the ground temperature because the ground is going to be 55, 56, 58 degrees. And in the summertime, if there's a slab sitting on top of that, it's going to keep the floor cool. So it can really help reduce your cooling load, which can be great. And just keep in mind in the winter time, um, it's going to pull down that slab temperature. And so you may not want that in the winter time. You need to at least think about that. Okay. 
but generally in most of the projects I've done, you know, and here and in Colorado and in Canada, everything under slab insulation is definitely a good thing. My slab, we've got four inches of EPS underneath it and it works great. Thermal bridge free. This is what thermal bridges look like when you look at them through an infrared camera. These red and yellow spots are energy, heating energy escaping from the building through thermal bridges. You don't want this. You want those. You don't want to see any red or yellow if possible. It's impossible to achieve, uh, but you can minimize it significantly. And that's the goal we're going for. Uh, thermal bridges happen in a variety of places. Uh, when you have a penetration of the insulating layer by materials with a different thermal conductivity, like a cantilever concrete deck, you see here, that's a bad, bad thing. You don't want that. Change in insulation thickness, change in direction, okay? Remember I said these can happen all kinds of places, and you need to identify all of them and analyze them. And the way we analyze them is with this um, finite element software, okay? When I first started doing thermal bridge analysis, I thought, oh, okay, well, if it's all red on the inside, the inside of the building, that's good. That's all we need to know. Well, that's not all you need to know, but that's like a good seat of the pants way to look at it. Now, what happens is if you have a thermal bridge, you know, like this or like this, let's say, it's going to run along the whole length of the building, the whole perimeter of the building. So if you just look at this little cross section, that doesn't look like much of anything, but it could be 200 linear feet of this thing. And that can be a significant energy loss. Okay. You don't want that. You can't have really. Not only do you get the energy loss, but you remember the FRSI number. You could get mold and mildew and condensation formation in the corners here. Okay. Again, you do not want that. Uh, wood studs do have thermal bridges, but they're less than steel studs. I typically don't see steel studs unless there's a huge layer of exterior insulation on the outside that mitigates that thermal bridge of the steel stud. Okay. By huge, I'm talking six to eight inches. Uh, you know, like an R30 exterior layer. Okay, that can work. A uh, point thermal bridge is something sticking out of the thermal envelope. Remember I mentioned a cantilever concrete deck, but also steel. Whenever I see this, I go like, ooh, that's bad. Um, I've got one client who is doing this in Southern California, but he's mitigating these with by putting a something called armatherm, which you'll see in a few slides between the inside and the outside. So it breaks that thermal bridge. Uh, pretty much kills off that uh, highway. And um, Steve? Yes. Sorry, um, in the chat, there is just a question. Is, is there a good free software to, to use to illustrate thermal bridges as shown? Free software. There's only one that I know of. It's called Therm, T-H-E-R-M. It's from Lawrence Berkeley Labs. It's free. It does the trick, but the user interface is not the kindest in the world. Okay. But you can download it and use it. Okay. I've used it. I don't like it. Um, and then the product that's used most uh, that you pay for is called Flixo, F-L-I-X-O. Um, and that's depending on which version you get, four or $500. If you want the fancy version, it's about $1,000. Um and that has a much better user interface, uh, but it, it definitely costs money. And then I see, George, you had another question. Does that mineral wool slab insulation have gravel and or liner underneath it? Yeah. Uh, you Typically, you want to put some kind of uh, vapor barrier under your slab insulation to prevent water intrusion from coming up from underneath. And there is going to be some kind of gravel, uh, and that's for um, uh, water... Uh, the term I'm looking for. I'm drawing a blank here. It's so that that if moisture or water does accumulate there, it's going to have a tendency to sink back into the ground and not pull right under the insulation. So yeah, those those are typical assemblies uh, for underslab stuff. Let's see. Did I talk about this? Yeah. Identify the thermal bridges, find them, analyze them with therm or flixo. Yes. Uh, advanced framing is a way to reduce thermal bridges, but it doesn't eliminate them. So you need to, I encourage, uh, my projects, we did this. Um, 
let's see, George. So thinner detail would have concrete over membrane, over insulation, over gravel, over membrane. Well, you're talking about two membranes. You don't really need two. You only need one. Okay, so it would be concrete over insulation, over membrane, over gravel in that order. Okay. Uh, now, again, there are different people do these different ways, but that's the, that's the ordering I see most of the time. I'll reiterate it again. Concrete over insulation, over membrane, over gravel. Okay. Uh, attaching insulation to a building on the outside, ideally you want thermal bridge free corrections. So, oh, concrete over insulation, over membrane, over gravel. Yes. Yeah, good. Um, so you, there are different ways to, to attach concrete. I'm sorry, attach insulation. The, the, the foundation thing sort of sidetracked my verbiage there. Uh, you want to make those as thermal bridge free as possible because there are going to be dozens or hundreds of those. Um, I found that actually a little bit of glue can hold the, the insulation in place, um, which is with friction almost. Uh, until you get the finishing on the outside done with furring strips and stuff like that. So uh, you may not need to deal with this, but you may, okay? Uh, that's bricks, we'll skip that. Facade clips, again, this is this is when you have like a, a curtain wall system like this or a facade system like this. The tendency on commercial buildings is to connect them with steel or aluminum. You don't want that. That's a thermal bridge, especially because they get connected to metal framing on the inside. Okay, which here shows the steel stud. So this is actually a fiberglass clip, which is a fairly non-conducting, and you connect that to a metal stud and you mitigate that thermal bridge. Again, free will. Notice the red zone here gets bent. The red zone here does not get bent. Uh, seat of the pants down. Uh, same thing with brick. Brick is heavy, you have to hold it up with something. Here is a fiberglass clip holding a metal brick shelf that holds the brick up, but the connection between the exterior structure and the, the interior structure, which is concrete, is fiberglass. So it breaks up that thermal bridge between the concrete and the steel. Um, very common thing to do. And again, we don't do much brick here. Uh, it's a lot of back east stuff, but um, this is one way they mitigate that thermal bridge. Window installation, very critical. It's easy to get thermal bridges here. And there are two ways you deal with that. One is to, on the right, it shows aligning the window frame with the installation as best as you can, okay? Um, that's a common practice. You can't always do it, but if you can, um, the results are better, absolutely positively. Oh, excuse me. Um, on parapets, I'm going to come back to the window thing in a minute. On parapets, again, which we don't have much of, but I do have a, a project in, oh, I think it's Burbank that actually has a parapet. Um, a typical approach is to insulate the whole thing. If you don't insulate the parapet, you've got a thermal bridge right here in the corner. Remember, corners are typical thermal bridge things. Uh, you can insulate the whole parapet, shown on the right. If you don't insulate the parapet, you get a big thermal bridge. Okay, that's what the calculation turns out to be. The other thing you can do is you can insert an insulating material right at the corner. And that turns out to be actually the best solution. Okay, and that's a material called autoclave aerated concrete. It's only R1 per inch. Okay, but it is a thermal break. It's lightweight, it's workable, uh, has very little cement, and it regulates moisture. So it's a great idea. It's not a common material here on the West Coast. It's used more on the East Coast because that's where it's manufactured. But it, you can use that in this particular case and it does do the trick. Balconies, remember I talked about the concrete balconies problem right there, cantilever balcony. There are special connectors for larger buildings that mitigate that thermal bridge. It's basically high density insulation with stainless steel rebar which is less conductive than steel. Um, and it pretty much mitigates that thermal bridge. This is a specialty product, okay? Uh, here's that thing where we have the steel beam coming out. Here is one type of way to break that thermal bridge. Okay, this is for a balcony also. Um, and then, oh, 
Where did the armor therm go? Oh, that's okay. We'll get to the armor therm. All right. This is similar to armor therm. It's a high density. I don't know what the material is, but it's it's very non-conductive stainless steel bolts because they're non-conductive. Um, Eves, I have this conversation on almost every project I do in California, residential. It's sort of like, I say, well, really, ideally, you want to have your air and water barrier to come up the wall and wrap over onto the roof. You're building a balloon. This is a balloon. This is an easy way to build a balloon. You should do it. And the question is, well, well how do I do my eaves? Well, there's several different ways to do that. Here's a picture of one. You create this whole eave structure and hang it off the side. Okay. Another one is to create like these. You do a, a ledger system up on the roof, but you fatten it up once it hangs over. And these get sitting on top of your air and water barrier. Okay. And then you insulate between these. All right. So that's just a couple of approaches. And that pretty much uh, with exterior insulation, that mitigates the thermal bridge for the most part of the eaves from both the roof and the wall. Uh, just don't use metal parts, okay? This is the way to rest your insulation on this uh, starter track here, it's aluminum. You don't want that, okay? Uh, use a fiberglass clip of some kind if you have to have a starter track. Otherwise, like I said, attach your starter course um, you know, with a non-conducting screw or connector of some kind, and then just add the rest on top of that. And hopefully the stuff isn't too heavy. You just hold it in place lightly with friction fit or furring strips, like furring strips like this. They can hold your insulation in place very nicely um, and uh, build the wall up with the exterior insulation that way. Okay. Foundation edges. Definitely a source of a thermal bridge. So you want to have continuous insulation if you can. Now here it shows exterior insulation on the wall, exterior insulation on the slab going to below grade, and then exterior insulation underneath the slab. Okay. Then here's some additional insulation. Okay. And here's your, your membrane. Okay, George, you can see your membrane there. And then here's your grout. Uh, Okay, and Dan Johnson, membrane needs to be in direct contact with the concrete for CRC and Calgary. Um Could be, okay, if that's a requirement, then you do need two membranes because you also want to have a membrane protecting your insulation as well. Otherwise, it'll reduce the R value. Thank you for that, Dan. Um, okay, let's see. Another thermal break. This is armor therm. This is the thing I mentioned a while back. Uh, high density um, thermal, it's insulation basically. And here they're separating this whole steel structure from a concrete pad on a roof, which is insulated on the inside. And it might be insulated on the outside when it's finished. I do not know. I don't have that picture. Air tightness. Okay, here's the dreaded blower door test. Okay, six ACH per hour. Um, Heat for, it's really important to do intermediate testing. Uh, here it's called preliminary testing. I suggest to my clients that they do, they build their thermal balloon, their insulated balloon first, um, test it, do a blower door test with just one door cut out, then cut out their rough openings for doors and windows, install their doors and windows, do another blower door test. Uh, get all their trades to come and do their rough in, do another blower door test, insulate, do another blower door test, drywall, do another blower door test, and then finish off and do a final, okay? Uh, you can never have too many blower door tests. I actually encourage my builder clients to buy a blower door and do what I just described. I actually have an architect client who bought a blower door and is doing that on his project on behalf of his clients. You can never do too many blower door tests. Uh, and if you have the equipment on hand, um, it's easy, okay? It's quick. The final result looks like this. It's more complicated. It's software-driven. That's okay. You get a specialized third party to do that, and that's just fine. Uh, here's the red, the red line test. This is your thermal barrier and your air barrier, okay, combined in one. 
There are lots of different types of materials you can use to accomplish this. Okay, you can do sprayed on stuff. You can do more sprayed on stuff. You can do rolled on stuff. You can do troweled on stuff. You can do peel and stick membranes showed on the right. You can do interior membranes, which can also serve as a what's called a bib system, a blown in blanket system for your insulation. So you can put your framing in, then you put this thing on there, and then you punch holes in it, you blow your insulation in like it's done here on this cellulose. Okay, then you seal those holes up. And this can actually be your air barrier, your vapor control layer, and your insulation installation layer. Okay, so you can get, you know, multiple benefits out of that kind of product. Okay. You can do exterior sheathing, which is waterproof and airtight if you seal the seam. That's shown on the left. That's the zip membrane or zip board, it's called. Uh, they have different formulas for walls and for roof that's the different colors you can actually get this with an r value as well okay it's basically a half inch osb um, with waterproofing on it uh, if you get it with an r 2.5 i think it's still considered strong enough for seismic applications but if you get the higher r values it's not suitable for structural purposes okay plaster Concrete plaster is considered specifically in the passive house world an air barrier if it's properly installed. Concrete four inches or more if properly installed is considered an air barrier. Okay. Uh, you do not want to use sacrificial layers as air barriers. Sacrificial layers, the obvious one is drywall. Okay. Because people are going to put holes in it because it's a finished layer. Intermediate layers don't necessarily work either. Um, here's testing of OSB, leaks like a sieve. Here's testing of concrete masonry unit, leaks like a sieve. Your spray foam, I already talked about that, how over time it delaminates. Um, so you're going to get leakage around the perimeter where it hits the framing, things like that. Um, here's other membranes. Okay, I already talked about this interior membrane. You, if you Put your air barrier on the inside, you want to protect it. And one way that's done typically is with um, a cavity of some sort. And the benefit of the cavity is you can actually put um, your finish, uh, not your finish, but your rough-in materials there too, like electrical and ventilation ducting and stuff like that. You can get uh, airtight uh, electrical boxes, but in my personal experience, these are a waste of time and money. They don't work that well. So. You can get all kinds of stuff to seal up penetration, special membranes, special tape. I like the tape personally. Uh, it's flexible, it works great. Foam does not work. Again, it delaminates and especially, it doesn't work when you have multiple wires going through some kind of penetration because you just can't get it airtight. And you can't get it airtight around boxes either. That just doesn't work, okay. Um, you want to use flexible materials. More importantly, you want to use materials that play well with each other, that are compatible. You don't want to start installing tape here. This is an unfinished air barrier, notice. It's just roughing it in place. But here it's going to be taped on this seam where you're taping the, the stego here to the concrete wall. That needs to be airtight. So you need to finish that off. And whatever you use to make that airtight needs to work really nicely with concrete and with stego. Here you can see around the window, there's taping. Okay, again, that tape needs to be compatible with the window frame material and the concrete, okay? Uh, Spray-on can work really well. It can get in nooks and crannies that other materials can't. Uh, that comes in really handy. Whatever you do, manufacturer's instructions, again, make sure that um, all the materials work together, okay? Windows and doors. Typical windows uh, have not very good R values. They leak. Passive house windows have higher R values, uh, both the glass and the frame, and they don't leak. Okay. Now they're not perfect. Windows are the weakest part of a building enclosure, period. And out of those, the frames are typically the weakest part of the window or the installation if it's not done properly. Okay. We do want to get solar heat gain up to a point when we need it, 
And that's one solar heat gain coefficient is a measurement of how much solar gain can come through glazing in a window. Now, if we take advantage of that, we can reduce the heating requirement of the building. So that's a good thing. But if we take too much advantage of that, the building can overheat, which puts us up the cooling requirement, and we don't want that. So sometimes, and I run across this pretty frequently, there's a delicate balance between the solar heat coefficient satisfying the heating demand, but not wrecking the cooling demand. Um, we struggle with that on some projects. We look at heat loss through every part of the frame or every part of the window, okay? We look at um, the frame. We look at the glazing. We look at the spacer. We look at how it's installed in the window, or so the wall assembly. So we look at all of those different things. Um, it's a very detailed analysis, okay? We need to do that because these are the critical components. These are where the worst things can happen. There are lots of certified windows. Some are manufactured in North America. Lots more are manufactured in Europe because that's where this stuff started. But the easiest thing you can do if you're trying to certify a building is get certified windows because you get all this data and you can just plug it into the modeling and it makes your life so much easier. Take my word for it. Doing a project that you want to certify with uncertified windows can be like pulling teeth to get information from the manufacturers or doing the analysis yourself using something like Flixo Return. Here are the various components. I already mentioned these. Okay, the glass. We look at the U value. We look at the solar heat gain coefficient. We have to tune those often. We look at the spacer specifically. We look at the frame. We look at the installation within the assembly. We look at the air tightness. Um, we check the FRSI numbers for this location here and probably this location here too, or wherever the interior, here the interior is gonna be here. So this location, this location, to make sure that we're not gonna have mold or mildew or condensation issue, okay? And here notice the window is somewhat in alignment with the insulation layer. Uh, it needs a little bit of structural support here, but the frame is, I'd say 50% of the frame is in line with insulation. That's good, we like that. We also like to, if possible, extend the assembly insulation over the frame, okay? Remember the frame is the weakest part of the assembly. Um, it's the biggest potential for thermal bridge. Well, if we cover it with insulation like we're doing here, we reduce that thermal bridge significantly, okay? So if we can do this, we wanna do this. Sometimes that's not possible because of the type of frame. Sometimes it's not possible because the architect doesn't like that kind of finish, or the whoever is going to live in the building wants you know a big wants to see a big frame or whatever. Okay, there are lots of reasons why you can't do that, but if you can do that, that's a good thing to do. Uh, traditional double hung, just don't get double hung windows. Period. Avoid sliders if you can too, unless they're certified. Built and turned windows are great if you can get them and if you want to pay for them. They're usually a little more expensive. A lot of these certified windows are tilt and turn. Uh, good quality awning and casement and fixed windows can do fine in a passive house project. Excuse me, I need a little drink of water. And remember, I've already touched on this for windows. We look at the comfort criteria and the hygiene criteria. Comfort criteria is the minimum surface temperature on the inside of the window. The hygiene criteria is the FRSI number that we check in the corners. We want people to be able to sit in their windows or sit in the on their window sills in the middle of winter and be comfortable. That's actually totally achievable. I talked about this. Ideally, you want the installation of the window to be in line with the installation in the assembly. Can't always be done, but if you can, that's great. Sometimes you may have to go to the outside or you may have to go to the inside for various reasons. Um, if that's the case, it is what it is. Figure out how to deal with it so you do not have comfort and hygiene issues. Um, this is a good install. Okay, this is showing in line with um, the window. I'm sorry, in line with the insulation. And here there's a little bit of over insulation on the outside. Now that's that looks nice in a picture. I'm not sure that's practical from a constructability perspective. Okay, it is what it is. 
Uh, makes for a great picture, though. Uh, not good. Here the window is in line with the masonry layer. Okay. So you're going to definitely have a thermal bridge here, and you're going to have an FRSI issue probably here and maybe here as well. Okay. So you're trying to avoid these kinds of things. Things are where it comes to at the design stage, the designer needs to be aware of what you're trying to achieve and understand these basic principles. So when you do a window detail, you automatically know that you want to try and do this kind of thing, not this kind of thing. So this doesn't become an issue later on. Okay, You know the issue, you solve the problem, and you move on. Again, here's another, this is uh, another good installation. Lots of insulation here, over-insulated on the inside, over-insulated on the outside. It's all good. Um, attachments. It, sometimes, you know, you have to place windows uh, outside, towards the outside, which is not recommended. But in this case, there's an exterior layer of insulation that's going to lap over this window frame. Okay, that's a good thing. So that mitigates the thermal bridge problem. And here they're holding the window in place with high density insulation that's bolted in with probably stainless steel bolts. All right. So um, you've got the structural issue dealt with, and then you wrap the whole window with insulation. That's a good thing. Here's another example with steel studs. Here's the steel stud right here. Uh, you've got exterior insulation over insulated on the frame. The frame is actually separated from the structural steel stud with uh, some plywood blocking and a couple inches of insulation as well. So just yet another example. Uh, I'm gonna skip that one, okay. When you do the install, you have to deal with the air sealing issue because you normally have a rough opening that's bigger than the window. Typically it's a half inch on, on all sides, okay. So here you can see the gap. Here's how the window is attached to the framing. And this is this is like a um, a high density uh, foam or plastic type of shim there. Okay, and you bolt that with these these metal things. But the metal things are going to be thermal bridges. Um, you fix that somewhat with these shims, but now you also have an air tightness issue. So how do you seal this window? One way to do that is with a goop. Okay, that's a technical term. Uh, you can do this with tape also. Uh, I've done it with both ways, and depending on the window, uh, I kind of like the goop because it deals with this kind of situation, which is harder to do that with tape, but you can. Uh, somehow you need to make this part of your balloon, okay? So we're dealing with two issues here. We're dealing with the thermal bridge issue, and we're dealing with the air tightness issue. Um, that's why windows can be some of the most complicated things. It's always good to do an initial install and uh, make sure everybody watches it, you know, all the installers look at it and maybe you test the window, which we'll see in a minute. Here's some more issues of, you know, taping a window and here's grouping a window, the rough opening first. Okay, that's, a, that's the same type of material as this, but you put it in the rough opening first and then you install the window and you finish it off. And again, it would be, you know, red or white. These are two different materials, but they're accomplishing the same thing. And then you can test a window on large multifamily buildings where you've got 500 windows. You definitely want to do this. And there are special equipment uh, and techniques for doing this. This shows one. You basically seal the window, hook this stuff up, and test it for air tightness. Uh, everybody I know that does large scale buildings does this very early on in the first window install. Okay, ventilation. We want good air quality. It should be continuous, it should be balanced, and it should have heat or energy recovery. Okay. Uh, the energy recovery should be at least 75% for certification. I've talked about the efficiency of it, uh, the watts per CFM. It should supply a minimum of 62 degrees Fahrenheit on a winter design day. That goes back to the comfort criteria. Even though this is very low velocity air, you don't want it coming into the building at less than 62 degrees, okay? And that goes back to the comfort criteria. You supply air, fresh air, filtered air to all the primary living spaces, living rooms, bedrooms, offices, classrooms, et cetera. You exhaust from 
uh, the stale rooms, or what I call the wet rooms, basically kitchens, bathrooms, utility rooms. Okay, and that's pretty much what we do. And I've never done a passive house project that did not use a certified passive house energy recovery or heat recovery. Um, it's it's crazy to do that too to not use this kind of equipment because it's going to hit all these metrics easily and they run like horses. They're just awesome. Um, I'll give you the simple example of the heat recovery. Uh, basically envision it's winter time and you've got 40 degree air coming into the house. Okay. Uh, that's cold. You've got 70 degree air coming out of the house. That's warm. These two air streams go by each other. Okay. They cross each other right here. The heat from the air outgoing air gets transferred to the incoming air automatically. Mother nature, second law of thermodynamics. So that 40 degree air um, recovers, say, 80% of the heat on the outgoing air. So by the time that 40 degree air gets inside the house, it's about 65 degrees. If they 62 degrees, remember our comfort criteria. So that 62 degree air comes into the house. That means that you only need to add just a little bit of energy to that 62 degree air to bring it up to 68 degrees, which is the minimum temperature you want on the inside of the winter. So the heat recovery basically uh, minimizes the amount of energy required to keep the building comfortable in the winter. Opposite happens in the summer, okay? You've got hot air coming in, you've got colder air going out. The heat from the incoming air gets transferred to the outgoing air. Um, and so again, the opposite happens, but again, you need very little energy to keep the building cool. Okay. It has to be balanced, but you can do it lots of different ways. You can put a big hunk of equipment on the roof of a multifamily building and do part of the building or the whole building, okay? Or you can put individual units in each, individual ventilation units in each living unit, or some combination. You can put individual units that do, say, a floor, okay? Or half a floor, or two units, or whatever makes the most sense. Um, the engineers that do ventilation and heat and cooling equipment for multifamily buildings are very smart people and they know how to slice and dice this stuff. Um, it's amazing what they figure out. Here's the big equipment on the multifamily buildings. Here's the little equipment on a small residential project. This is typically what it looks like in single family residences. Uh, we call this the octopus installation. Okay. Um, you these are some installation criteria. Okay, the ducts, the, in, the ducts going to outside have to be uh, insulated with a vapor tight seal. That's to avoid condensation in case there's cold air coming in or going out. Okay, remember the, the durability and the comfort criteria and all of those things and moisture mold and mildew, et cetera. They have to be quiet. You cannot hear them. Uh, even when they're turned on their high speed, you cannot hear them. Okay, uh, and they're filtered or 13 or 14 on the incoming, or six on the outside to protect the equipment. Uh, it needs to be airtight ductwork. It's just like, um, you know, ducts for heating cooling equipment in the HERS world. It needs to be airtight. It doesn't get tested. Well, it can. For residential, it's not tested. The airtightness is not. For larger buildings where you do custom ductwork, you know, metal ductwork, they should be tested and they should be as tight as anything you're going to see in the first world too, you know, 5%, 4%, 3%. Okay. Uh, and if they're going to be tested, they should be done before they're covered up. You know, that's just common sense. Uh, let's see, Greg, where does the filter go for the heat recovery on the inside or the, on the inside or outside? At the inside, how do you insulate the metal parts for heat transfer? Okay. The filter goes on the, on the incoming side. Okay. All of the filters are at the equipment. Okay. Here are the filters in this equipment right here. It's these two slots, one for incoming, one for outgoing. All right. Um, insulating the metal parts for heat transfer. Well, this whole box is insulated. Okay. So it's, you're basically, this box is basically like a little passive house that's connected to the outside. It's airtight and it's insulated. Um, the filter slot, are gasketed so they're airtight. 
Um, so everything is insulated. Um, I think that answers your question. Insulate the metal parts for heat transfer. The metal parts, the heat transfer is not done with metal parts. It's done with a super thin membrane. So it's basically like a little polymer, a little hunk of plastic, a thin hunk of plastic. The thinner, the better. Um, it's more efficient that way. Okay. Okay. Duct sealing, duct sealing, duct sealing. Yes. Um, and balancing. Okay. And that's a whole, a whole separate kind of process. Uh, special equipment for balancing. When you do a path of house, if you certify it, even if you don't, you should have somebody come in and make sure that the system is operating as designed. Okay, that's just common sense. And it's a specialist and it's a third party thing. Okay, here's two types of equipment. Um, everybody has their own, their own type of equipment they like to use. And for certification, there's going to be a balancing report that shows the final balancing, and it should be within 10% or less. Um, and so this can take a couple of hours, depending on the project. Heating and cooling system, 75%. Yes. Sorry, before we go into the, oh. the next section, there's just one more question in the chat. I see um, it. Okay. Thank you. The intake duct and exhaust duct need to be insulated for condensation. Yes. These guys, these are attached to the out, these are going to and from the outside. So yes, those are insulated and covered with a vapor proof uh, coating of some kind. All right, now notice the ones inside the house are not insulated. Um, that might be good practice depending on the situation, but they're not required to be. It's just the outcome, the ones attached to the outside. Thank you, Mario. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, 75% reduction, almost any kind of heating cooling system. I tell people, you know, on low load houses to use electric resistance for heating. It's cheap, it's easy. Like underfloor bath mats, everybody likes the warm bath floor after we're coming out of the shower, okay? Um, you need a proper design. Uh, in this world we live in now, if you can't use something like dumb electric resistance, typically we're looking at heat pumps. Not required, but it's a good thing. That's true for heating, cooling, and hot water. And the world is just kind of leaning in that direction. Lots of different types of heat pumps. That's a whole topic in itself. 3C Ren has excellent webinars on that topic. Uh, here's just some pictures of some equipment. The stuff on the top is for small houses or small buildings. The stuff on the bottom is for large buildings, okay? Um, we don't need to dig into that. Ducts, refrigerant lines, everything should be insulated, okay? Now, insulation can happen on the inside of the building by running duct work through insulated walls or insulated assembly. That works fine for air movement stuff, but for refrigerant, you really do need to uh, insulate refrigerant lines, okay? And by the same token, you should be doing that with hot water, which I'll show you in a minute. So here's some here's some pictures of refrigerant line insulation. All right, uh, here's metal duct work, which probably should insulate regardless. Uh, but the plastic duct work used on the octopus, which I showed you, generally is not insulated. It's run through an insulated assembly, if anything. Hot water overall strategy. Uh, this is common sense, and Title 24 digs into this pretty well. Reduce the use of hot water. Okay, that's just common sense. Low flow device device it to the use me. Low flow devices, small diameter pipes, short as possible pipe lengths. Uh, insulate the pipes, especially on the hot water side. Okay, um, you know, it, it's not for residential. It's not hard to design a very efficient a hot water system. Uh, part of it depends on the room layout. You want to put all of your hot water consumption locations close to the hot water source if you can. So that's really an architectural issue. Um, that's why this stuff needs to be talked about very early on if you can. And the architect needs to know that this is one of the things you need to do. Decentralized hot water, yeah, lots of choices. There are lots of different ways to do hot water. Uh, right now we're doing heat pumps. Those are the those are the hot ones du jour. 
five years ago, tankless on-demand gas was big in Title 24, but now in the 2022 code, heat pump is is the favorite one. Um, uh, yes, lots of different ways to do this. This is a commercial design. This is minimizing pipe run. Okay, this is traditional three pipe design. Well, just by looking at the design and reconfiguring it in this particular case, this was a multifamily building. They saved like, oh, geez, I don't know, you know, 70,000 BTUs of, of energy for heating hot water per year and $200,000 on top of the piping and, and $100,000 on labor and all of this stuff just by redesigning the hot water. The numbers were huge. Um, and uh, you just have to look at these things. Here's the insulation of okay, domestic hot water pipe insulation. Just like QII for, for wall insulation or assembly insulation, you should think about, think of QII or quality insulation installation for hot water pipes too. You want to eliminate thermal bridges. You want to foliate them, fully insulate them as much as possible. Uh, here's some pictures of some insulation, okay? The code typically has uh, minimum level. Um, and I think this is what they might be, but I don't know. I don't worry about that so much in Title 24 anymore because all the projects I work on the hot water lines are insulated and embedded in an insulated wall assembly. So they get doubly insulated. So uh, they more than meet the requirement. You do pumps, they should be efficient and they should be controlled, okay? Um, you don't want continuously running hot water pipes, hot water pumps, excuse me. They just, that's a terrible use of energy, okay? User activated recirculation pumps are the way to go. Finally, QA and QC. Remember, it takes a team. This is a team sport. Uh, lots of different people involved, okay? Everybody needs to be on board. Everybody needs to understand what the goal is, and they need to be motivated to do this, they need to want to do this, and they need to talk to each other and ideally be trained to, okay? Um, I'm gonna skip that one. There are different, when you're doing a passive house and you wanna certify, different things come into play at different parts of the construction schedule, okay? Now notice here, we're talking design stage, design stage and submittal and training and mock-ups. There's a lot of stuff in there. Inspections and photos go on throughout the process. Okay. Somebody somebody typically needs to be sort of like the quality control person that's making sure everything is going well and is documented as well too, if you're certified. Okay. There are different documents that have to be submitted. Um, there's a, the certification criteria outlines this very clearly. Okay. Uh, this is just a list of the categories. Uh, here's different certifiers will give you a list of different types of photos they want. Okay. And uh, you need to make sure that you have a certifier on board early so you know what they're going to want to see. Um, and if you don't, take a lot of pictures because they're going to ask for pictures. Um, and then at the end, the construction manager basically has to sign this thing that says, yes, we built the building according to the construction documents and we com commissioned it and tested it and it meets the passive house criteria. Ta-da. Okay. Uh, for larger projects, it's good to have checklists. Uh, and in fact, for larger projects, most of the ones I've seen uh, do have checklists and they get to use throughout the process, okay? on residential projects, which are smaller with a smaller number of people, where it's simpler. I hardly ever see checklists used, but it's not a bad idea. Okay. Uh, there needs to be an air tightness plan. And this, and this goes back to the idea, the idea also of how are you gonna do your final blower door test? Well, you need to figure that out early. And who's in, who's in charge of guaranteeing the air tightness? Okay, who's gonna be like the, the air tightness police, all right? Very important. It's, it's good to have one of those. On my project, I do that myself, or I have in the past. I don't do that anymore. Um, I, I find somebody qualified to do that, either the architect or a Hirsch Raider or somebody like that. Takeaways. 
insist on training. All subs should be aware of the project goals. Everybody needs to be involved throughout the construction, That's especially the architect, the owner, the energy consultant, the general contractor, everybody. Uh, to plan for a mock-up to see project details implemented almost on any project, it's a good idea to do a mock-up of the window installation or have everybody watch and pay close attention to the first window installation. That's going to be the toughest one. And maybe the intersection where the air barriers are uh, intersecting in different places. Okay. Uh, interim blower door test. Uh, do that often, as many times as you can. Uh, specific person focusing on air tightness, checklist, open lines of communication. Mario, how many projects have you done that have been certified passive house? And do you see an increase in actual projects being built to these standards? Definitely an increase in project. Yes. I'm seeing compared to five years ago, the interest has snowballed. Now you go from like 1% to 5%. That's kind of a snowball, I guess. It's still that well, it's not that well known. It's not that well um, looked for. Okay. Uh, certified passive house projects. I've been involved in, I'd say, a half a dozen, depending on how you count. Some of them are still in process. I've actually got a half a dozen that are in process uh, that are going to be certified, assuming that everything gets done. So this is not a huge part of the building market. Uh, we'd like it to be. It's necessary. Uh, but we're not there yet. Okay. So I would encourage you to incorporate this into everything you do. Um, yes, quality issues, quality of organization. You just, you need to focus, focus, focus. You need to be well organized. You need to keep this stuff in mind at early stages. And you need to keep it in mind throughout the process. If you do that, you should be fine. And five principles, comfort, hygiene, efficiency, a team sport, and anybody can build a path of health. Here's a bunch of resources. I'm not gonna read these. You'll get these on your slide. Um, one that's not listed here is, oh, I mentioned Passive House Network, get their emails. Uh, Passive House California, get their emails. Passive House Network has a bunch of online content. The other one not listed here is PassiveHouseAccelerator.com. They've got a huge amount of online content as well, okay? Uh, and for those of you that YouTube, Matt Reisinger, build.com, YouTube. He talks about passive house a lot. So I've actually had several clients that have come to me and said, I want to build a passive house. I said, where did you learn about this stuff? And they said, Matt Reisinger on YouTube. And I'm like, oh, okay. He's doing a good job of marketing this stuff. With that, I will say thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions, although it's been a tight squeeze. And Sarah has some stuff she wants to talk about too. Yeah, so I'll just run through my my closing slides really quick. Um, just as always, we have our Energy Code Coach service uh, that can help answer questions on Title 24, Part 6 or Part 11, um, questions that you might have on your projects. And um, on the next slide, uh, we have AI learning units for today's course. And then I listed out uh, some upcoming courses uh, specifically to just calling out that uh, free info session that's coming up, gosh, I guess that's next week, September 5th. Um, it's for the Build Bootcamp, the hands-on training. So we're doing a free info session so that you can learn a little bit more about the training. Um, and then uh, there's a link there for the, the training as well. And I'll re-add the uh, flyer into the chat too. Great. Um Yeah. But with that, it is 11. So if folks have to hop off, please do. Um, but we can stay on for a minute or so if there's any other lingering questions. Sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, and I see, Mario, you said, yeah, Dave Edward with Earthbound Homes has a YouTube channel as well. Yes, he does. I think he just started that recently. Dave Edward is a, a builder out of, I believe, San Jose that does um passive house buildings some have been certified or some are being certified some have not been uh, but they're built to the passive house standard 
So, other questions? I don't see any. Can yeah, and if there's Hello? no other questions, we'll go ahead and. Oh, sorry, Mario. Yeah. Um, sorry. How you doing, guys? Uh, Mario. Good. Um, how you doing, Steve? Nice to meet you. Um, so I have nice a question to too. with. I know that there is a a growing um, a growing trend toward towards electrification. Um, as far as passive homes is concerned, I was on a job site in Culver City with Christian Canopel. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, he has a client he's building a new home for who's actually doing all concrete, um, all glass, and he he's decided to go with all natural gas. Um, now, I, I've done, just so you guys know, I've done my boot camp. I did it in Brooklyn. Um with uh with ben and enrico and yep. um so passive houses and and it's not as much of my concern as with where my parents live the electrical rates go up from four to nine i don't know if that's something that's happening in california statewide but from what i've told and what i've heard especially with christian he said because since there is this trend to move towards electrification it's not it's not required under a passive house it could be Correct. natural gas, propane, depending on what sort of resources are available. Or, or, and, and obviously the benefit to electrification would be source production. So actually site production via solar panels because of the reduced, you know, what is it? Two thirds goes to waste as far as electrification goes from the power plants. So yeah. I don't, I, I don't mean to, I don't, I just mean, I just meant to put it out there. I it wasn't, it wasn't anything. I believe in electrification, the most we can do you know, to supplement ourselves is better, but it's just for those who, if we are going to move this, if we are going to allow this to go further into the industry, especially in interfits, we are, we do have, you know, energy sources that are already there. Um, and not at all to, not at all to, you know, obviously, per, you know, creating electricity would work as well, but yeah. You know. <laughs> Uh, uh, no, you're absolutely right, and there is no requirement for passive house. You can you can hate them and cool them and do whatever you want, however you do it. Um, and the electrification thing is interesting. Right now, it's a hot topic. I'll be interested to see if it's still a hot topic or accepted wisdom five years from now. Yeah, because these no, things I'm, seem I'm to go away. Someone, I'm definitely someone who says put as many as much solar as you can. The apartment I live here in Joshua Tree, my landlord has full solar on everything. He's completely off the grid. He was one of the very last, he went to the Supreme court to, because they were trying to limit him on how much production he could have. He was the <laughs> one of the, he was the last case to go through the state to where he basically has, you can run air conditioners and everything, all the apartments. He actually ends up selling energy back to the grid. So yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah, I just, I just wanted to put it out there because it is, Sometimes you are limited to what you can or can't do, especially financially. If you can't go to electrical, you know, Arizona yeah. has a very high electricity rate. California does as well, especially the time yeah. of use. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and the other thing, too, just related to that that I'll just throw out there, which I imagine you probably already know, just uh, with natural gas, just the effect on the air quality inside the building is yeah. not a good thing. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Definitely so. extraction on your heat ranges, on yes. your cooking ranges. Yeah, I exactly. Understand. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, I, I have an anecdote. I've got a client now who is building a house in, um, it's in Pasadena, but it's up in the mountains next to, you know, a big natural reserve or something. It's got lots of trees and stuff. He wants to heat his, he wants to do his hot water with an electric resistance tank, like good old fashioned electric resistance tank, because mm -hmm. it's simple. It has very few moving parts. He doesn't care that it's going to like leak and break within 10 to 15 years because they'll just replace <laughs> it. And he doesn't care that it's electricity because he said, well, I'm just going to put a ton of solar, you know, on the side of the hill and it'll be free water as far as he's concerned. Yeah. So, you know, everybody has their own, their own uh, approach to this stuff. It makes it kind of interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. You're quite welcome. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mario. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's with that. Um, if there's no other questions, we'll go ahead and close the course. Uh, thank you again for everyone uh, for joining us today and hope you have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, as always.
It's a Thank pleasure. you, Sarah. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> okay, you're quite welcome. Everybody take care. Build passive houses. <laughs> Do your training. Yes. With these passive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bye. Goodbye, all. <laughs>